Hello, my name is Peter Whitehead. Uh, during the lockdown, I've been producing for the U3A Bromley Art Appreciation Group uh, a series of talks. Uh, the Art Appreciation Group is just a, a group of people who are interested in art. We're not experts, I'm not experts, so um, please bear that in mind when listening to this. Uh, the images have all been found uh, on the internet, mainly through a site called wiki art um, the subject of today's talk art and the great war really examining how art and artists responded to the great upheaval uh, that came to the world in 1914. military painting had been popular in victorian britain um, because Britain needed to be represented as an imperial power. And Lady Butler, uh, whose painting you see here, was one of the best knowns. Um, she was helped by the fact that she married a general, so she had access to participants in various military encounters, such as the Charge of the Light Brigade, the Afghan Wars, and as you see here, Rourke's Drift. Her paintings were very popular at the Royal Academy, um, a police guard had to be set up around them to deal with the crowds. Uh, and this is the kinds of painting, military painting, that you would see up and down the country in officers' messes, um, the heroic acts of the regiment. And of course, you can, I think, see the influence that this had on later films. Um, this could almost be a still from uh, Zulu in the 1960s. But war came in 1914, and one of the first things that was done is to set up a propaganda bureau, but this was secret. It was called Wellington House because it was established at um, an office of that name near Buckingham Palace. Um, and people such as John Buchan, Conan Doyle, H.G. Uh, Wells, John Maysfield, Thomas Hardy, they all worked for Wellington House in the propaganda department, but uh, none of that was acknowledged until 1935. So what was the Bureau there for? Well, there wasn't much it could do at the start of the war with photography and film. Uh, that was really uh, not very well developed. Uh, so it focused on stories in the newspapers, uh, on literature and art. A lot of what it produced was so-called atrocity propaganda. So it would take uh, stories and spin them so that the enemy, principally the Germans, were seen in a bad light. So the sinking of the Lusitania uh, was presented as an atrocity, even though the Lusitania was actually carrying weapons the execution of nurse Edith Cavell uh, and something called the Corpse Conversion Factory towards the end of the war. Uh, the propagandists came up with this brilliant idea to suggest that the Germans were boiling down bodies to create soap. Um, uh, untrue. Before 1916, there were exhibitions by artists who were serving at the front. Uh, such as Eric Kennington and C.R. Nevinson. Uh, but by May 1916, the idea of an official war, war artist had been created, and Muirhead Bohm was the first of those. And by 1917, the uh, painters that you see there, Eric Kennington, William, Sir William Orpen, C.R.W. Nevinson and Paul Nash, they were all part of the war, war artist scheme. This gave them access to the front to um, paint and draw what they wanted but the downside was they were because they were official war artists they were subject to official control over what they could produce this is possibly one of the best known images of the first world war it's produced by alfred leet in 1915, sorry. Um, so quite a lot of propaganda posters were produced. Uh, the Britain Wants You, uh, Lord Kitchener uh, there. Uh, 
the idea that this was a war that involved everyone from miners, barristers to uh, a gentleman in a top hat there marching off to war. And part of the atrocity propaganda really joined an Irish regiment because the Lusitania had been sunk off the coast of Ireland and women and children had drowned. Uh, so art is put to the service of uh, recruitment. But there was also the view of the war as a crusade, uh, good versus evil. Uh, this painting by Butler called Blood and Iron uh, is uh, a prime example of what you get, certainly at the start of the war. The Kaiser is sitting there on his horse looking vaguely demented with the angel of death at his side while Christ tends the wounded Belgium. In the background you can see Belgium in flames, uh, people shaking their fist at the Kaiser. There's no, uh, no doubt in this painting which side God is on. God and Christ are on the side uh, of the Allies, not of the Germans. And this finds its way into early art about the war. Um, in 1914, I think at the end of 1914, the German Navy, who you can see on the horizon in this painting, actually bombarded Hartlepool, um, much to the disgust of the uh, population, partly because they wanted to know where the Royal Navy was while this was going on. But anyway, um, you can see that there's some soldiers uh, setting up a machine gun I think and rifles in which to take pot shots at the battleships on the horizon. I doubt whether that would have been very effective um, but more importantly is what's happening on the right hand side of the painting. There's an elderly man helping a girl, there's a woman escaping with a child. The public would have known what happened next uh, which is that the mother and child were killed and uh, the young girl with the old man um, was severely injured by shells. Over 1,000 shells were fired into uh, Hartlepool uh, during this encounter. So it's another mark of the uh, atrocity uh, of the war and the Germans in particular. And the religious side of the war is brought out in this painting, 1914, by James Clark. Um, a young man has been killed. Uh, he, his hand rests on the feet of Christ. Uh, he has sacrificed himself uh, in, in, for his country and for his Christ. Uh, this was a very popular uh, painting. Uh, it caught the mood of the country, uh, the, mood, the mood of sacrifice, that this was all worthwhile. Uh, the original of this painting was bought by Queen Mary and the image has been reproduced on many stained glass windows. Um, but also it was produced publicly. So the graphic uh, magazine, I think, um, at the time produced this painting uh, and you can see the the words attached to it really uh, evoke this feeling of sacrifice uh, and uh, solemnity is, is mentioned there. Now at this time there are no war memorials as such so uh, this painting and prints of it um, were very popular uh, and in some cases they formed the basis of a local shrine which would be set up at a street corner to allow the uh, neighbourhood to commemorate the boys who'd gone off to war uh, and died. Um, interesting though, you didn't get it for nothing, it cost you one shilling, which I think in 1914 must have been um, a not insignificant amount. So the graphic made a nice profit out of this. There was a film produced 
1916. You've probably all seen this. Uh, any documentary about the First World War includes shots from this film uh, that called the Battle of the Somme. Uh, it was actually fake. Uh, at the time, uh, it wasn't really possible to take either photographs or film of the front line. The technology didn't permit it. So the Battle of the Somme was restaged on Salisbury Plain for the film. Um, and I don't think it was acknowledged. I think most people who flocked to see the film and, and thousands did um, thought they were seeing what life was like at the front line. But it's a sanitized version of it. People dropped to the floor um, dead in a very um, decorous fashion. They are not blown to bits by shells. Uh, Photography had been around since the time of the Crimean War and the American Civil War and photographs had been taken of war. Um, but it was photography was seen really as an art form, not a historical record. So uh, in the American Civil War, for instance, the corpses were rearranged uh, to make a more uh, suitable artistic uh, layout. And the photographs we have apparently of the uh, charge of the light brigade. Uh, all the cannonballs have been found from somewhere else and placed in the picture. So you couldn't rely at this stage at any rate on film or photography uh, to produce a realistic picture of the war. Now, some artists served in uh, the First World War. I've mentioned some of them already, um, not just on the, on the Allied side, uh, the Central Powers, Germany, also had their artists. This is Otto Dix, who uh, was uh, born in 1891 and lived to 1969. After the war, he was a ex German Expressionist uh, painter. Um, he was uh, not favoured by the Nazis. He was one of those whose art was considered to be degenerate. But he was already an artist when he, uh, uh, before the war, uh, all German young men served in the army. Uh, unlike the British army, which was a small professional force, the German army uh, was uh, a, conscript, a conscripted force even before the war. So Dix joins up in 1914. By 1915, he's seeing himself in this way as a target. In other words, if you think of those pop-up targets with soldiers on them that uh, um, even today people take uh, pot shots at, uh, Dix is seeing himself as nothing more than a, a flesh and blood version of that. And it's quite convenient that on his headgear, you have these two targets right in the middle of his forehead. What they are actually, if you look at this, uh, I'm not sure whether this is a photograph from the time or a still from a film later on, but you can see that the German headgear had these kind of poppers at the front, which gives the impression of the two targets that uh, people are aiming for. Uh, by later in 1915, he's gone full expressionist. This is the impact of the war uh, on uh, Dicks. Uh, it, it's a very violent, uh, percussive view of the war. Uh, there are explosions going on all around, and Dix himself is in the centre there uh, as the soldier. On the British side, I quite like the paintings of Nevinson. Uh, so he was born in 1889. So in his 20s when the war started and originally he signed up for the Red Cross. Uh, and uh, that gave him access uh, to the front. He had been a painter like Dix before the war. Uh, he was a futurist uh, painter. The futurists were very interested in technology and in travel in industrial subjects. And this is one of them, the arrival, clearly a transatlantic liner arriving at port. Uh, but rearranged this kind of futurist, um, oblique cubist uh, manner. And he takes this form of painting to the war. Uh, 
in 1915, La Mitrailleuse. A Mitrailleuse is a machine gun. It's the French for machine gun. So you can see French soldiers here firing a machine gun, very much in a futuristic uh, style. And he also paints Ypres, where the British Army spent a lot of the time. Uh, in 1916, uh, the buildings are being shelled, they are being demolished, fires are breaking out, uh, and Nevinson uh, portrays all that. He also makes a very good attempt, I think, to portray in painting what the impact of a bursting shell might be. And the futuristic style is probably uh, the one that um, really reflects that. So you've got the shell bursting in the middle, the walls being blasted apart. Um, it's quite a, an, an effective presentation. As you go on to the wall, though, Nevinson becomes a bit more realistic and naturalistic. Um, a Tauber was uh, a German bomber. And the German bomber has flown over the civilian area, dropped bombs, and you can see has, has killed uh, a schoolboy. This, I believe, is what Nevinson saw in Belgium at the start of the war, and he represents that in this uh, painting. Uh, he gets taken on uh, as a war artist and starts to paint what he sees at the front. So this painting, Paths of Glory, 1917, shows clearly amidst the barbed wire uh, two dead British soldiers. Um, that was too much uh, for the British censor and they decided that the painting could not be shown in that form at any rate. And then they decided to stick a label which said censored across it to say to the British public you are not being allowed to see what is really happening at the front. And that got him into even more trouble because he revealed the existence of censorship, uh, which until then had been a, a secret. Uh, so Nevinson's obviously trying to uh, tell the public exactly what was happening uh, in, the, in, in the war, but the censorship uh, got him uh, and produces shots like this. It's realistic, but it's very much behind the scenes. These are signalers putting up uh, cables, uh, telephone cables or telegraph cables. Uh, and it's all very safe, I think. Um, is this official censorship or is this self-censorship? I don't think we know. But Nevinson had obviously realized that if he wanted uh, to produce images of the army, uh, then they had to conform uh, and they had to um, be in some sense sanitized. It really leads on to the question was how effective was art as a way of showing to the British public what was going on at the war? Um, in fact, if you hear servicemen talking about the war later on, they do say that people back home, their families and civilians, could not understand how horrendous life at the front front would be. The only people they could talk to were other servicemen. Um, I had two of my, both my grandfathers fought in the war. Both of them uh, lost brothers, killed in action. Um, I only knew one of my grandfathers. Uh, but he couldn't talk about the war. So the day he died, he had nightmares uh, about it. Uh, we nowadays would call it post-traumatic stress disorder, not known at that time. Uh, but the reality was something so awful uh, that, it, that, that people struggled to represent it. Uh, they struggled to represent it in art. Um, they struggled to tell people about it. Ad allied to this, you've got a strict control of imagery, as I mentioned before. Uh, officially, soldiers were not meant to carry diaries or cameras, and letters from uh, other ranks certainly were censored by officers. I've mentioned before the technical difficulty of capturing the reality on film, although this was improving as the war went on, as we'll see later. The war poets 
like Sassoon and Owen were trying uh, to get the message through, but actually at the time that, that had very little impact. Um, they have a much greater impact when you get to the 1960s. And our view of the war now is largely framed by what you read in the poetry of Owen and Sassoon and, and the others, the, um, uh, the, the memoirs of people like Robert Graves. That wasn't very effective at the time. And so was it possible for art to represent what was really going on at the front line? Well, let's see what some of the war artists were doing. Kennington here, before he was a, a war artist, actually he was serving. He's uh, one of the figures in the background here. Uh, this is more about portraiture of the soldiers rather than about action. Although we can see the carrying rifles, one of them has uh, got a German helmet, uh, which is obviously captured. Uh, but this is very much soldiers out of the line, uh, not in action. Sir William Orpen, a very well-known painter of the time, again, he's producing portraits, unnamed portraits of a sergeant in the Grenadier Guards here um, against a very blue sky here. He's a very clean looking soldier, uh, I must admit. It's a romanticised uh, portrait of a soldier, quite honestly. In 1917, the Schwaben Redoubt was one of the key areas uh, over which the Battle of the Somme had been fought in 1916. Um, but what Orpen produces here is a, again a romanticised landscape. Yes, the landscape is blasted by shell fire. It's recovered a bit because the battle has moved on. But where were the human figures in this landscape? Uh, there's no sign of any human habitation uh, at all. There were 5,000 casualties at the Schwaben Redoubt on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, but I doubt whether you would rec you would realise that from this painting. By the time you get to 1918, things have changed uh, a bit. Nevinson was not allowed to represent dead soldiers because they were clearly British. Um, Orpen is allowed to represent dead and decaying Germans uh, in 1918. Uh, the only good German is a dead German type of approach. Uh, but photography was catching up with art. Um, as I said, the censor was, wasn't particularly bothered uh, with portrayals of the German dead. Um, photographs were being taken, uh, but they were not really published in the newspapers. Um, the photograph that's going to come next, if you feel that you don't want to see graphic photographs of the impact of war, just skip over the next um, photograph. But it was used in 1964. The BBC produced a 26 part documentary series about the war, the Great War, which is very uh, interesting, but by then the Owing Sassoon view of the war had taken over. The lions led by donkeys, the oh what a lovely war view of the war as a great, uh, a useless sacrifice regard, um, rather than the religious war that we saw uh, referred to at the start uh, of these slides. Um, it wasn't a just war anymore, it was a disaster and the photographs of which are taken start uh, representing that so that the next one was part of the uh, title sequence of that documentary um, and this was what the war meant by the 1960s death mud decay uh, none of which had really been reflected in art at the time. Elsewhere in the forest, Romanticism reigns. John Singer Sargent, the uh, well-known portrait painter, the American portrait painter, was employed as a war artist towards the end of the war. Um, 
I find this quite peculiar. Um, Thou shalt not steal. It looks like a couple of soldiers, very clean uh, soldiers, scrumping, I don't know if it's plums, apples, or what it is. Um, there's another of the commandments that says, Thou shalt not kill, but that seems to have been forgotten about in this scene. Again, it's sunny. Um, it, it's very romanticised. Um, but perhaps this is what the um, censor and possibly the public demanded uh, at the time. Paul Nash um, would later be a war artist in the Second World War as well. He depicts here the Battle of Passchendaele, um, the mud, the death, um, but uh, again, is not that photograph more effective in depicting exactly what the war is about? You put them side by side, I think you can see that uh, Nash, even with the palettes of greys and greens and browns, the black and white photograph actually is probably much more effective in showing how awful that mud is uh, and how it grips uh, and, and tries to draw people down into it. I don't think Nash has um, managed that at all. But he does use the futuristic techniques uh, this of the Eep salient in 1918 with a uh, star shell burst and the uh, layout of the trenches is probably slightly more effective. I mentioned that Muirhead Bone was the first official war artist. He produced pen and ink sketches like this of scenes from the war which were published uh, in book form and you could buy the prints. Um, but again, <clears throat> They're a bit anodyne. Uh, this is Flanders, according to Muirhead Bone, but it's all behind the scenes. There's a lovely windmill in the distance, uh, the tents that the soldiers occupy, um, but they are no more than Lowry type figures in the distance. Uh, not really a true representation of the war. Um, Soldiers themselves quite often kept notebooks. This is one by uh, Herbert Hillier, who I think is uh, uh, was an Australian soldier. I don't know whether he was a professional artist or not, but what he obviously had with him when he landed at Gallipoli in 1915 was a sketchbook, and he used that to sketch the scene. And then you see he's put some notes on it about a fine sky, a leaden clouds, <clears throat> and things like that. So even though soldiers couldn't take cameras into the front line, they did take, some of them did take sketchbooks and these formed uh, the basis uh, of later artwork. Bern's father was one of the soldier's favorites. He wasn't very popular with the war office to begin with, um, but uh, they came to realize that what he was representing in his cartoons basically uh, were what the soldiers at the front line recognised as being the the truth. So old Bill, there is this uh, old soldier who's seen it all before. She says, full of determination and plum and apple, plum and apple jam, which was um, ubiquitous in the trenches along with bully beef. Uh, and the, well, if you knows of a better old go to it under shell fire, that's one of the most um, frequently quoted um, lines uh, of, of the war. Uh, he originally Barnes Feather had been a commercial artist working in advertising before the war. Um, eventually his work got approved by the war office. Others turned their hand to producing works of art or commemorative pieces in the trenches. This is my own collection of trench art which I've assembled uh, over uh, a few years. Um, not necessarily made in the frontline trenches, probably more often made uh, behind the lines. Uh, and a lot of it possibly made after the war as souvenirs, but um, there was plenty of raw material. These are all shell cases. There are 8 billion shells fired by all sides during the uh, 
uh, First World War, and each shell fired leaves behind one of these shell cases, um, vast shell cases which can be fashioned into these vases um, in a vaguely Art Nouveau style that I've acquired uh, over the years. Um, the uh, ashtray there uh, with the bullets commemorating the um, Menning Gate in Ypres, so that is later, that is 1920s, but um, I bought that because it reminded me that my grandfather had an ashtray just like that. And I think we've got some close-up views of uh, the shells, the shell cases, the vases, and the different items. This is the type of painting that would be produced from the sketches we uh, saw earlier. So by at the end of the war, Norman Wilkinson's a very fine maritime painter. Um, I don't know whether he was actually at Suvla Bay or whether he used other sketches, but you can see how the sketch that was made in 1915 might be turned into a painting uh, such as this. A lot of Wilkinson's work is at the National Maritime Museum in uh, Greenwich, but he had a bigger impact on the war that he developed camouflage, particularly uh, for ships. The U-boats were a great menace. Uh, they were causing a lot of damage to British shipping. Um, they didn't really have any way of uh, counteracting that, but what they could do was to try and disguise the shape and size and direction of sail of the various ships and the dazzle camouflage that you see here is what Wilkinson developed um, to achieve that and here's a photograph of an actual dazzle ship that was on the Thames embankment between 2014 and 2016 as part of the commemorations of the war and you can see if you saw that through a periscope of a, of a U-boat you might be quite um, uh, hard pressed to work out exactly what it was, particularly if it was against the background of the North Atlantic, not of the Temple Gardens. Um, the Temple Gardens in the background rather destroy the impact of the camouflage there, but against a predominantly grey background waves, uh, you might struggle to, to work out exactly what that was and what direction it was sailing in and therefore put off um, a U-boat who was trying to fire, fire torpedoes at it. By 1918, although it was by no means clear that the war was ending, um, the War Memorials Committee was formed. Um, and this moved away from the propaganda uh, element of the start of the war to a historical record. So the committee brought in young artists to produce works of art which were going to form um, the basis of something that was called the Hall of Remembrance. Now the Hall of Remembrance was never actually built but it was going to be the nation's war memorial, a, a big a great hall filled with works of art. So lots of artists were asked to produce works of art for inclusion in the Hall of Remembrance to be built after the end of the war. Um, it's actually quite uh, far-sighted because uh, you know the war was almost lost by the Allies in March and April 1918. Um, it really wasn't clear that who was going to win until August or September of 1918 but the, there'd been the recognition that the loss sustained in the war need to be need to be memorialized somehow. There was a public demand for that and this was what um, the War Memorials Committee was reacting to. So these are all works of art that were actually produced for the Hall of Remembrance. They ended up in the Imperial War Museum's art collection. The Imperial War Museum's art collection is, is quite extensive, it's quite interesting, but it's severely underused. Um, until about 10 years ago, there used to be an art gallery at uh, Lambeth Road, you can go in and see these works. That's all now been removed. Um, the War, Mem War Museum is much more interested in the kind of interactive displays and works of art. So where you can see these works of art now, I'm not quite sure. But Nash, who we saw before, again, is using his 
um, uh, futurist vorticist approach to um, show the many mode but again this is much more I think what the soldiers of the time would have recognized his brother John Nash again men on the fire step uh, with the shattered wood Oppie wood I think is on the Somme Wyndham Lewis He's a vorticist, uh, so a development of, of the futurists and the cubists. He served uh, with an artillery battalion, and so he he is representing what he sees in these um, almost robot-like figures um, uh, at the uh, at, at the battery, which is being shelled, which is under attack. The most famous painting I think destined for the Hall of Remembrance is, is another sergeant which is much more um, a representation of what the war was really like but you see it was produced in 1919 it's produced after the end of the war um, it was the picture of the year uh, at the Royal Academy in 1919 uh, it's a very large scale it's about 20 foot across uh, and the figures in the center there, I think they're more than life size, but um, it represents soldiers who've been gassed, being led to a dressing station. The guy ropes on the right are the dressing station. There's another um, procession uh, of troops being brought in on the right hand side. Some of the troops are got their eyes bandaged. Some of them are turning away to be sick. Um, in the foreground, you've got the wounded lying there. Possibly some of those are dead. Um, it's got the feel of a religious procession. But actually, if you look through the paint, look through the legs of the soldiers on, say, on the left hand side, um, they actually see there's a football match going on in the background. Uh, and on the right hand side in the sky, biplanes are fighting um, a, a, a dogfight. Uh, so there's a lot more in it. You do actually need to see this painting to appreciate it. Reproductions of it don't really do it justice. Having said that, the last time I saw it, it was in Manchester at the Imperial War Museum there, uh, and I don't know where it is now. Uh, it seems to have disappeared from public view, which I think is a great shame because it's it's always been one of the most popular um, depictions of the First World War. Nevinson, who we saw earlier, whose work was censored by the end of the war, he is allowed to produce this, the harvest of battle, complete with corpses, um, barbed wire, shell holes, burning villages in the distance, a very grey and green and sickly uh, palette. Um, the dead and the wounded are being um, removed from the battlefield. Um, and there's also a kind of suggestion that some of these are rather ghostly figures and they're going to come back to haunt people uh, after after the war. Singer Sergeant also reverted to type um, with these this portrait of the general officers of World War One in 1922. This is in the National Portrait Gallery. It's another big painting but it commemorates the generals of the war, not the fighting soldiers. Um, these were the type of portraits that used to lie in the wall of the war office uh, when I worked there. Um, they all disappeared in various uh, redecorations, but uh, this is the kind of official uh, portrait of the war. But memorials were not just in painting. The cemeteries of the First World War um, started to be constructed very soon after the war <clears throat> around sites, Tyne Cot, which is in um, uh, outside Ypres on the battlefield of Passchendaele, was constructed around an old dressing stations so in the trees uh, on the right uh, of that uh, 
aerial photograph uh, that's where a dressing station was so lots of people died and they are buried uh, there at the cross of sacrifice and the wall at the back is the memorial to one of the memorials to the missing um, so quite a lot of those uh, graves are unnamed uh, there are 11,965 graves at Tyne Cot, it's the bit which is the biggest uh, cemetery. 8,369 of those are unnamed. And on the memorial to the missing at the back, uh, there are 35,000 names. The architecture of the memorials is quite classical. Um, particularly the Menin Gate in 1927, again in Ypres, uh, which many soldiers will have marched through uh, on their way to the front. Uh, that has got nearly 55,000 names on it, uh, a memorial to the missing, and that's where uh, every night at eight o'clock there is a, the last post is sounded. It, it's well worth going to see if you haven't. The, on the right is the Teepval Memorial, uh, by Lutyens in 1932. Um, the arches, the arch form of it, is actually uh, determined by the fact that it needs to contain more than 72,000 names. So you need the space that the arch creates to put all those names uh, on that memorial. The last memorial, and probably the most futuristic of them, is this one at Vimy Ridge. Vimy Ridge overlooks, um, it was a key um, battle in 1917, I think, which the Canadians really um, dominated for the first time. It, it's taken by the Canadians to see the start of Canada as a separate nation. And the figure in the centre of the memorial there, the uh, grieving woman uh, is Canada bereft, um, Canada weeping for the loss of her sons. But uh, the pylons there with the other figures on, again, this is a very symbolist, I think, rather than realist uh, memorial, but it's the first place where they actually preserved the trenches as a memorial as well. So you can uh, see what's left of the trenches at Vimy Ridge as well. In this country, um, war memorials took various forms. Um, the ones I like the best are the ones by Charles Sergeant Jagger. Uh, he, his dates are 1885 to 1934. He served in the Artists Rifles and the Worcestershire Regiment at the front, at Gallipoli and at the Western Front, so he knew what he was talking about. He'd been wounded three times and won the Military Cross. And this soldier here, is on platform one at Paddington. You might actually walk straight past him or run straight past him if you're heading for a train to Bristol or Bath. Uh, but he's there, very solid. He's reading a letter uh, from uh, his sweetheart. But you can see how weighed down he is with ammunition, with his great coat and everything else. He's a, he's a real uh, figure. And on the other side, at Hyde Park Corner, there are a lot of uh, memorials, uh, some to the First World War, some to later. This is looking up, the bus is coming out of Park Lane with the Intercontinental Hotel in the background. This is the memorial to the um, Machine Gun Corps with the boy David in a classical contraposto stance, but he's got a Lewis gun uh, either side of him and Goliath's sword. It's mixing up imagery uh, quite dramatically. The inscription on the back of the memorial uh, is Saul hath slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. It's rather strange um, imagery to produce for a corps which suffered 30% casualties uh, in the First World War, the Machine Gun Corps. Um, <coughs> but next to it, well, just around the corner is Jagger's Royal Artillery Memorial, which I think is one of the uh, best memorials uh, of the war. You can see the howitzer there in stone, and then the figures all around it. Um, 
much more than life size of um, the soldiers in the Royal Artillery uh, who fought in the war. And I think we can end here with just some close ups of that, of the driver uh, with his whip and his chains and his uh, his uh, gas uh, mask at his side and Jagger actually also represents these memorials to people who died so on this memorial you have a dead soldier um, covered by his cape uh, with his helmet on him and it refers to the Royal Fellowship of Death so I think if I summarise um, all this how did art deal with the great war originally seen as a propaganda tool um, producing religious imagery um, the war artist scheme is set up but is a very sanitized version of the war but by the time you get to the end of the war and the hall of remembrance works and some of the war memorials you start to see a recognition something closer uh, to the reality well, thank you very much for listening to this. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll try and put up some more uh, talks uh, later on. Thank you.